Welcome to the Inspiration North podcast, inspiring stories from inspirational people and how they found their passion, their true north. I'm James Eaves. And I'm Michelle Minikin. And this is the Inspiration North podcast. Today's episode, it's not luck, it's what we make of it with Shamshad Shah. We talk about being who she was expected to be versus who she was authentically, connecting with your emotions, gut and heart to make life-changing steps to reach bigger goals, and how the world is your oyster, but you don't have to eat them. Shamshad is an expert in helping you transform your well-being by giving you a toolkit to create simple daily habits and understand your behaviours to live your best life. Prior to establishing Simply Wellbeing UK, Shamshad worked in the NHS for 27 years as a specialist dietitian. She also utilised her teaching degree to create innovative nutrition courses. Highly experienced in intuitively listening and creating a holistic map to navigate your wellbeing journey, Shamshad created the Three Steps to Vitality system, giving you everything you need to transform your wellbeing. Good morning to you, Shamshad. How are you? Good morning, James and Michelle. I'm doing really well. Thank you very much. And it's great to be invited on your podcast. Yes, thanks for joining us. So as we have you planned in for the 28th of December launch, we thought as it's the end of a year, which has been fairly odd, (laughs) fairly odd and up and down. And people might be thinking, is 2021 going to be a bit better, hopefully, maybe considering their health and well-being, we thought you'd be a great guest to have on the show for this time of year. Mm -hmm. So thank you for joining us. Let's jump into the first question. So when you were a little girl, did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up? When I was a little girl, I used to love doing role play of being the teacher. Mm. And I don't know where that came from, but years down the line, when I looked at what my values were in some fancy schmancy quiz that I did Mm. it was it was quite interesting to know that my top skill was learning Mm. so my poor younger brother used to have short straw because he had to be the pupil and I used to spend hours teaching him reading writing numbers and various other bits of learning um, needless to say, it must have done some good because he's gone on to become a, a very high flying professional. So I, uh, <laughs> I have to say, I, I would like to claim a stake in that. <laughs> um, and then when I got to my A levels, I, I had this vision that I wanted to become a lawyer mm-hmm. because. I was very into justice and equity and inclusivity. But at that time, my parents had other ideas because I came from a very traditional Asian background where your career isn't chosen by you, your career is chosen by your parents or your aunts or your uncles. It's a very extended family decision, which Mm -hmm. looking back now, I'm like, how did I settle for that? Because I was such an independent child. Mm. Um, So it was decided for me that uh, a lawyer wasn't the best route to go and I needed to choose a medical profession. But my grades weren't good enough to be a doctor. So it's like, "Mm, well, she's a bit of a problem. What else can we do with this child? (laughs) (laughs) So I ended up in uh, dietetics and it was, uh, it was quite unusual because GPs aren't, don't have that same role now, but my mum went and had a chat with our family GP. Mm-hmm. He was a lovely chap. And he said, you know what? I've got a friend. Uh, her name was, what was her name? Jilly or something. And she's a dietitian. I'm going to send around with some leaflets Mm -hmm. and maybe Shamshad would be interested to have a chat with her. And that was the start of my career. That's how Mm. I ended up in dietetics. Brilliant. That's brilliant. (laughs) So how do you, how do you, how do you become that? What's the process? Yeah. 
Right. Well, it's it was a four year degree. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Aberdeen to university, which was another huge step in an Asian family because Mm -hmm. it was a good six hour journey from where we lived by train. Mm. I was given some option there because I got an offer from London. I got an offer from Cardiff. It sounds awful, but when I went to Cardiff, I decided it was a completely different land because everything was written in Welsh and I couldn't understand anything. Mm. (laughs) I went to London and it was dire. It was King's College and we were shown this one bedroom. It was like something from a workhouse. There were two sparse single metal frame beds and I can still remember a wooden table in the middle with an uh, half empty bottle of milk on it. And I just looked at it and think, I'm not living here. No. So the default was Aberdeen and I absolutely fell in love with it as soon as I went up there. I love Scotland. I think it had something to do with the fact that all of our childhood holidays were taken in Inverness because mm. we always went up to Inverness, August bank holiday and stayed around there so I, there was a bit of resonance uh, it took me back to my childhood but I love Scottish people very friendly really nice settled in really well but my parents had the backlash of you've sent your daughter away so far do you know what she's up to do you know <laughs> if you can trust her <laughs> and I think I'm very lucky in that sense that my parents had no qualms it was like okay well we've we've made the decision on your profession but you can choose where you do it mm. brilliant that's really good yeah. Yeah. four years in scotland and four then... years in scotland and then i was very fortunate in my career in that well i say use the word fortunate but that's very inaccurate really because i think we make our own fortune a lot of people say oh you're blessed you're lucky um oh that was good luck But actually, we make our own fortune is what I've realised now. And by saying I was lucky to fall straight into my first job is actually probably demeaning my own value because I was probably jolly good, Mm. which is why they picked me. So I finished my degree and a lot of students went home um, because there was about a six week wait until you results came out but it was too far for me to go home and come back so I spent the time just exploring the countryside around me taking trips out stuff that I'd never done in the four years that I'd been there Mm. and then when I was packing up I came across this professional journal that I'd been subscribing to but clearly never opened because <laughs> people never open their journals do they no. they just land and get shoved in a corner mm-hmm. and I thought oh I guess I should make an effort to apply for a job then so there was this one job going and it was remotely where I lived it was Derbyshire mm. and I thought I'll just have a go because I've got to start somewhere. So I sent it off and thought nothing about it. And then by the time I got home, um, Mm. there was a letter waiting for me. It said, you have an interview. And it was like at the end of that week. And I was like, oh gosh, right. How do you prepare for an interview? And I was like, well, I don't really want this job. It was just an experiment. So Mm -hmm. I'll just turn up and like, see how it goes. (laughs) And, um, I distinctly remember I walked in to the room and there were about six, all women. It's a very women orientated profession, dietetics. There were six uh, females sitting there and I got chatting to them. And uh, I was the only one for whom it was the first interview. They'd all done the rounds like quite a lot Mm -hmm. and they clearly wanted the job. And I sat there feeling really guilty because I thought, I don't really want this job. I'm just doing it because you have to. So I walked in and then they said, would you mind, would you be able to wait? And I said, well, my train back is at this time, but yeah, I can wait until then. And then they called me in and said, um, you've got the job. I was like, I've got the job. 
crikey why why me <laughs> there's all those Not really all those Thank people you. out there who <laughs> clearly really want this job and they've all done their rounds i've got lots of experience in interviewing so that's how i fell into my first job and that set the the pattern for the rest of my career like whenever i went for a job i got it excellent congratulations <laughs> it's a good skill <laughs> You apply to be prime minister now, please. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so at the time, I never thought anything about it. But on reflection, yeah, I clearly had a skill to know that when I went for a job, I was the right fit. And I clearly had the skills to to get the interview. Excellent. That's good. What do you think? Uh, so talking about skills... There's obviously lots of knowledge involved with dietetics, but I guess are the skills where you've got to be good at communicating, building rapport with people to try and have some sort of, I guess, trust and opening up. Is that, I'm sure you're very good at that, but what is that something you'd say is relevant? Yes, I think what it took me quite a while to realize that I had a natural skill at communicating mm. and putting people at ease and move fast forwarding to where I am now. I've realized that my biggest skill is intuitive listening of being able to listen to people and know exactly where they're coming from. And active listening is actually a skill but it's something that I always took for granted which I think is where I found in my career you build a relationship with your patient because you see them over a length of time mm. and certainly when I worked in pediatrics I would first see children when they were babies and I would still be seeing them sometimes when they turned into teenagers. So you really built up a rapport and a relationship, not only with the child, mm. but with the parents as well. And I often had the comment that I want to book in with Shamshad. I don't want an appointment with one of the other members of the team, mm. which at the time I took as feeling quite guilty because I don't why like we're all we're all a team we're all highly skilled we're all qualified to the same level what I didn't accept at that time was my ability to build very good rapport and very good relationships with people mm -hmm. and I think I would say that is one of my top skills it's not just about having the knowledge and the skill set to impart that knowledge, which we're all taught at university and as part of your training and you're tested on that um, in your CPD. But it's that different skill set of really building a rapport and a relationship that they feel comfortable because what you're doing with patients is changing their whole mindset you're changing their habits you're changing routines and beliefs and thoughts that have been set in them right from childhood and I think a lot of people don't appreciate that when you say I want to lose two stone by the summer I want to give up smoking I want to start going to the gym three times a, a week and gain 50% more lean body mass. They're quite difficult tasks to do because you're setting yourself such a huge Mount Everest goal is how I always describe it, mm. that when people don't achieve that, because in order to achieve that, they rely on that wave of motivation they feel at, at that particular time. They rely on willpower and willpower diminishes quite rapidly when we hit a road bump in life, when things become overwhelming because there's 
a lot going on at that time. And I refer to your bucket being full and then it starts to overflow. Mm -hmm. So willpower can go out the window pretty quickly. And it's about being able to connect with your emotions and your heart and your gut in order to make that change. And that's where fast forward where I am now when when I do things differently because it's about connecting with your emotion with your gut with your heart in order to make those life-changing steps to reach your bigger Mount Everest goal Mm. yeah we always say that that willpower is never enough to to change and it's all about we, we talk about tiny habits and anchoring so putting putting a little habit onto a habit you already do so every time you go to the loo wash your hands do 10 star jumps or four squats or whatever it is and it's it's all that that compound effect as well yeah it is because that's excuse me in many ways when you think about it to get to a point of saying i want to lose two stone whatever the amount is in effect, those small things are what have got me to where I am today. Mm. Say, well, it's the extra snack I'm having when I get home, or it's the extra beer or glass of wine I'm having in an evening. And it's not <laughs> Sitting the... next to some mince pies at the moment, so they're really going, eat me, Shelley, eat me. <laughs> so it's it's not that you wake up one day and you're two stone heavier. It's, it's a sort of creep over a, a length of time, isn't it? So yeah, in the same way, you, you can switch that round. Yeah, it's a journey. But I think the mindset of people these days is very much about quick fix. Mm -hmm. And that goes across the board. And I think if you look at younger children as well, they're very much about the here and now and the quick fix mindset. Mm. I know. We always say that in terms of that lack of patience. We used to have to wait until the you know, the book was in the shop and then we had to make a trip to the book, the bookshop to get the book and then come home before we could read it. But now it's literally a case of, oh, quite fancy new book, Kindle or Audible or, you know, or it comes tomorrow and you don't have to leave your, don't have to leave your bed almost. It's, we, we've been watching some movies we recorded on More 4 or something with, with adverts in. And we were, <laughs> it's like, you don't realise that we used to watch, programs with adverts in and the adverts you'd get up you'd go to the loo you'd make a cup of tea and then all of a sudden there'd be a shout it's coming back on and everybody'd race the sofa again <laughs> so and they don't have that because it's on demand straight away i've said we're gonna have an evening where you actually have to sit through the intro and then when the adverts are on you've got to sit through the adverts so it's we talk about you oliver really likes the simpsons and I'd sort of say it's you'd have two episodes. I think it was on Channel Two, mm. and you'd get home and you'd have to you'd watch one after the next. But that was it. That was your two episodes for the day, not the six hundred that he's got recorded on Sky. <laughs> 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 so I sometimes joke about the younger generation and this this problem of everything's available no. straight away. Do you think then in the next ten twenty years? that will be a positive or will it have an adverse effect on what we're doing with our bodies, so to speak? I think there's positives and negatives to it, James, certainly in terms of gaining access to information and learning. It's a huge plus. I remember going back, I'm showing my age, but to the Britannia encyclopedias that every household had. Love them. (laughs) And you had to actually flick through them to find the information. Goodness, my kids wouldn't have that patience now. So there's a positive that you've got a wealth of learning and knowledge at your fingertips. Mm. The downside is that they want to reflect that in their everyday life. So there is no patience to work through a process and that's the key it's a process if you want to embed new habits it's a process it's not a quick fix if you want to achieve a well-being habit it's a process it's not a quick fix and 
all the products that are out there, whether it's um, to lose weight and you buy a, a product really, uh, without naming names, uh, you can buy a very prescriptive plan and it tells you you can have so many points or whatever to count your weight to losing weight mm -hmm. or you can buy slimming shakes and if in 30 days you will gain your ideal body shape if you take the shake instead of meals for 30 days and yes they get the results but they're forcing you to do it within a time scale but they're not teaching you to understand your behavior they're not teaching you to understand your thought process so for example if you have achieved your ideal body image in 30 days with this set of shakes but then you go out to a buffet are you uh, are you going to change anything? No, because your old thought process is still there. It's saying, oh, I fancy that and that and that. And well, I've paid my money, so I should at least try all of the oh, six puddings on show because I've paid my money. That mindset is still there. You haven't changed your mindset in the slightest. And then you think, oh, dear, dear, I'll have to, uh, I'll have to go back on that 30 day shake program again, because that's the only thing that works. And I had a conversation with a lady, highly intelligent, highly professional. She's actually a health professional. And she came to me and she said, Shamshad, I really have lost my ability to know how to choose food. I rely on shakes. I've been living on shakes for nigh on 20 years now because I don't trust myself to make the right food choices. Mm -hmm. So what, what we've done to ourselves in this culture is we've taken away that ability to trust our own instincts. We, we're all born with instincts as to what to choose, why we choose it, how to eat it. It's the why, what, when, how factor. We've lost that ability as adults, either because it was overridden as a child. I had another client and she was always told to finish what's on her plate. She couldn't leave the table, regardless of whether she liked it, whether she felt full, whether she just didn't want to eat it. She couldn't leave the table until it was finished. So what you're doing there is you're overriding your body's own signal. Because I go back as a really great example to when you're weaning a child. These toddlers will happily swipe the bowl off the table if you're not listening to them. And they're telling you, I've had enough. I don't want any more. Or I don't like this flavor. If you're not going to listen to them, they'll just swipe the bowl off the table. And there you go. End of story. <laughs> You're so busy cleaning what's on the floor that, that you end up taking them out of the high chair and they get their way. Mm -hmm. But they're telling you I'm full. They're telling you I've had enough. But as adults, it's been overridden, very sadly. And we can't see that because it has become so embedded in us. It's mm. fascinating. Mm. Yeah, I remember those days of yeah, Oliver wouldn't eat anything mushy. So weaning him was pretty tricky. So we did baby led weaning. So if he could hold it and eat it, he'd eat it. <laughs> if he couldn't, he's like, no. <laughs> so, which was also his first word, actually. So <laughs> so what, what led you to leave the NHS? I think... I went into the NHS because it was part of this expectation of being a child of an Asian family. Mm. So there was that. So it was who I thought I should be. It mm. wasn't really my authentic self, mm -hmm. which I think is one thing. Second thing, you're always looking for a very sound profession when you come from an Asian family and the medical profession is 
very sound Mm. rather than following your mission or your passion which is something that I've learned much later on in life and so being in the NHS was all I'd known in my adult life I identified with it it was my badge of honor it became my identity because the NHS is a very powerful organization it gave me status and it gave me respect which are all big ticks in the Asian community Mm. um but what it didn't give me was it reached the point because the NHS as an organization has evolved it's very different now to how it was when I went in Mm. and it's very much about you exist you don't live you're traveling at our shamshad traveling at 100 miles an hour every day as opposed to shamshad who had a life it was almost a robotic existence you had a very set routine from the moment you entered you were literally at 100 miles an hour you were eating on the go often clinics overran so i used to have like Uh, half a sandwich or a snack in my pocket to last me through like the afternoon you're multitasking all the time I didn't feel in control I felt very much out of control Mm. and the more out of control you feel you start to go into overwhelm and a lot of people do end up going into burnout I didn't go into burnout but I could see that I was heading that way. I was constantly exhausted. It was a case of the weekends were where I recuperated to go back onto this hamster wheel on a Monday morning. Mm. So I suddenly decided that actually it was no fun living this life. It wasn't really what I wanted Mm. for the rest of my life. Sure, it gave me a team to work with I enjoyed that multidisciplinary I enjoyed having that badge of identity I enjoyed making a huge difference to the children that I was working with I loved the rapport I had with them Mm. Um, and it was a decision that I'd been thinking about for a while but it, it then became actually a forced decision in the end because how it came about was we were I was working at um, a children's hospital and we moved to Newcastle and I automatically thought oh I need to apply for jobs and I got the job interviews and I got a job offer but then there was something in me that pushed the pause button and actually thought well why you you hated it you used to moan it every day that you were exhausted you didn't have quality of life you couldn't do the stuff that you wanted to do so why are you going back on it so I decided to jump ship and I quit the NHS but then it was a case of oh gosh what now <laughs> what is it that I do want to do I know what I don't want but what mm-hmm. is it that I do want to do so it wasn't uh, dancing and singing and performing on stage. It was, it was something linked, I imagine, then. <laughs> but what I find interesting, though, is there you are performing a role which is helping lots of people transform their lives, even their life expectancy in some ways. But they're, in your own self, are slowly being chipped away at to not enjoy what you're doing despite Mm. helping all these people so we're guessing with your current venture simply well being uk has that changed therefore yeah yes so i think that was the key for me it was when you're in the nhs you're dealing with a very prescriptive type of outlook and we're all cogs in a wheel Mm. So everybody is a cog, but you don't see the cumulative effect. You're just your own cog. Somebody else will be a cog. And I think the key for me was when I had a patient in front of me, 
what I found I was tending to do was the whole holistic thing with my patient. Mm. But that was frowned upon in the NHS because you have a very tight 15 minute slot. That is your slot. You need to give what you need to give to get them to where they want to be in 15 minutes and then they're in, out. Mm. Conveyor belt. But if you say, for example, I remember going back to a point where I had an old chap. He'd been a solid working class guy all his life, born and brought up in the Northeast, very traditional Northeast patterns, went out for a pint with his mates. There was a working club, fish and chips on a Friday night and Sunday roast on a Sunday. He was diagnosed with having diabetes. And all of a sudden, I had to sit in front of him and say, this is no good. This is no good. This has to go. You have to change this. You need to lose weight. You need to start moving more. And he just sat there with a glazed look on his face, like, shoot me. Mm. <laughs> it's like, my life is no longer worth living. Mm. Thank you, Shamshad. <laughs> <laughs> and I sat there and I looked at what it was that I needed to say to him. So, you know, this lovely NHS glossy diet sheet. Looked at him and I just put the diet sheet away and I said, look, I said, there are things that you're going to have to change, but clearly at the moment, they're not even on your radar. So for the sake of my notes being audited, I'm going to write that these are your goals that you need to work towards, but I'm not even going to talk about those today. Mm. What we're going to talk about is you, how you're feeling, where you're at, what is it that's important to you at the moment? Mm. And he just relaxed because I was connecting with his emotion. What was the most burning issues right now and that wasn't losing weight that wasn't giving up cigarettes that wasn't giving up his alcohol at the moment there was a whole wealth of other well-being holistic stuff Mm. that was more important so we worked on that in that conversation Mm. and further down the line I then started to work on the other stuff that needed to and he did really well in the end you know but that was the difference and for me that was what I was finding consistently is that this prescriptive way isn't the right way it didn't sit with my values Mm. because my values are to inspire people to empower people to make their own change Mm. not for it to be a prescriptive change that's forced upon them. And I think that was the shift, that was the difference, that even though I was doing a great job, I was getting the results, you know, you were transforming people, people who were really poorly walking in and they left with a spring in their step because, you know, they've got their health back. Yes, you're right, that should have been enough. But the way it was being done, it didn't sit with my values. So mm. that's where I felt I had to I had to leave and I had to I had to change the way I did stuff. Plus, at the end of the day, my own well-being was important to me. I was in a profession and an organization that should support and empower you in your in your well-being that is what the NHS is all about but in actual fact in reality the majority of NHS staff face burnout Mm. because it is such a pressured environment and it does become stressful because you are a caring profession and even though you walk away from your patients at the end of the day, you don't actually, you live and breathe those patients. When Mm. I had babies in intensive care, I took them home with me. They were in the back of my mind till I went back the next day and wanted to see if the changes I'd made had changed their biochemistry. It's the first thing that I used to do, ring up the ward. Oh, you know, 
ha, ha, has he shifted? Um, so you don't, when you're in a caring profession, you don't, you don't leave it at the front door. It's not a nine to five job. You do take it home with you subconsciously. So my own well-being was key as well. And I knew that I didn't want to live this robotic life forever because I didn't want that stress to then trigger other conditions that inherently I was going to inherit. Being from an Asian background, diabetes was very predominant in my family. High cholesterol, stroke were all highly predominant in my family. The biggest factor for all of those is stress. Mm. So what is what's different with Simply Wellbeing? How, how do you feel now that that's all set up and tickling, tickling, ticking along nicely? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think the difference now is that the work I do still makes a difference to people. I see that all the time. The difference being is I now feel valued and I now have a mission and a purpose. So the way I've created the vitality system, it's underpinned by three very clear steps. And I take people through those steps using very simple techniques. So they create habits, they're creating habits that are going to stay with them and they're going to have a toolkit. They have a well-being toolkit as opposed to a prescription, mm. I think is the key difference. So the well-being toolkit is with them forever. They can dip into the toolkit when they need it. And I think the difference is that it's more authentic to who I am. My values are more aligned. I feel valued by the people I work with and I also value myself because in the NHS self-care was an optional extra self-care is now intrinsic it is part of my working day to look after myself as well as looking after and making a difference to the people that I work with and I still have that growth one of the ways that my business has shifted is that um, very recently I've partnered with Northumbria University to create a well-being app mm. and for me that is aligned with my values because at the moment a lot of my work is one-to-one -one coaching or a group program but people have to pay for that mm. so that is not inclusive and that is not equitable health but by creating the app that I'm going to create, that will be free of charge. It will be inclusive. It will be equitable. It will hit more people. It could be global. It's going to change lives. It's going to transform well being at that level that fits in with my values because. Mm -hmm. Going back to the time when I wanted to do law, it was about justice. It's about everybody should have the same. Mm. I know we can't in this world, but in terms of well-being, why should the people who can pay for this advice get it and the people who can't pay for it miss out? Because it's that band of people who actually probably need it just as much, if not more, mm -hmm. than the people who are in high power jobs and have the ability to pay for this sort of toolkit and knowledge. So I think that's the difference that now I'm able to offer well being at a much wider, inclusive, equitable level than I actually could in the NHS, even though the NHS service is free. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, Single-handedly solving all the world's problems. I love it. Absolutely love it. <laughs> I think the key thing for anybody thinking of transitioning out of something that's really solid and comfortable into something where they see a vision is 
accepting and letting go of that old skin and that identity and accepting that it's okay not to know where you want to go and the key is just to be curious because I didn't know what I wanted to do it's just about being curious about what else is out there Mm. just saying yes to anything that comes up some alleyways will be a dead end but some will lead to something else Mm. and it's just like following what's in your heart and in your gut yeah and I like I like the fact you you know you you use your values as well to help guide you awesome thank you for that um we are going to move on now to the quick fire round Um, and so James is going to take take it away with the first question question one an easy one (laughs) what would your ideal holiday look like Oh, my ideal holiday would be total relaxation by a pool with a mocktail and a really good book. Mm. Oh, yes. Holiday jealousy there. (laughs) Holiday envy, whatever the right word is. (laughs) That sounds brilliant. Okay. Question number two is what is the weirdest thing you've ever eaten? Weirdest thing I've ever eaten? Well, I would like to say something like snails, but when I was in Morocco, I was like, nah, I'm not eating that. (laughs) Um, I think it's not weird, but I'd say the weirdest thing for me was being offered oysters as a kid on a school trip and looking at this slimy mess in the shell and not appreciating how expensive they were and just refusing it. I think that's a very sensible decision, personally. <laughs> I'm not great with seafood generally, so. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I think they're over. Have you eaten oysters? <laughs> I would have this image that watching James Bond movies and things like that, he'd have, you know, have a dozen oysters and you think, oh, they must be amazing. And caviar. And as soon as I've had them, it's like. Yeah, oh, I wasn't, I wasn't hung up on caviar either. I remember it came on a meal and it was like, well, this should be amazing. It, it cost the earth. I looked at it and I was just like, I cannot eat that ball of black, whatever they are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, me too. Gross. So question number three, you're chosen to be the wellness expert on the next mission up to the International Space Station. You can take one must-have ingredient with you. Which do you choose? Definitely self care. <laughs> I love it. I five. <laughs> I was expecting something else. Like, Sarta. Uh, yes, or limes or <laughs> cumin or something, something to spice things up. But no, okay. Self care is a good one. It's brilliant. Awesome. Come back in packed. <laughs> Here's your pouch of self care. <laughs> you must, must take it today. Don't use it all at once. <laughs> cool. So if we could put you in a time machine, Shamshad, and take you back to your 18-year-old self, what advice would you give to you? Mm. To my 18-year-old self, I would say anything is possible. The world is your oyster and enjoy the journey to finding your purpose and passion. That's brilliant. I love the fact you put oyster in there as well. <laughs> it, could be the, it could be the world is your oyster, but you don't have to eat you them. You don't have to eat them. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a strange thing. I don't know where that came from. It's like, why Why would the world be an oyster? I don't know. It's difficult to open. It's dangerous. <laughs> Disappointing when you get into it. <laughs> it's <an> expensive. <laughs> oh. Absolutely slimy and horrible, don't you? <laughs> So for our listeners, if you would like to find Shamshad, the best place to find her is the website simplywellbeinguk.com. So it has been an absolute blast hearing all about your story. We've known you for a wee while, so we knew some bits of it, but we have learned something new today. Mm, So thank you. Mm. Thank you very much. It's been great absolutely chatting to you. Thanks everyone for listening. Check out all the show notes at inspirationnorth.com. 
Join us again for the next episode when we'll be chatting to another inspirational person. If you like this, subscribe and tell your friends. If you didn't like this, subscribe anyway and tell everybody. Ha, 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 ha.